Hi everybody, this is Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio, one of our very most popular fiat currency kind grandpas is back, G. Edward Griffin, uh, we really appreciate you taking the time. He is the author of The Creature from Jekyll Island, it, it, it's in its fifth edition now, um, which to people who know about ebooks is something that happens with trees. He said, uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island, a second look at the Federal Reserve. He is the founder of Freedom Force International. You can find him at realityzone.com or freedomforceinternational.org. And that's a, a brain full of letters to remember, but we'll put the links uh, on the podcast and the video notes right below. Uh, so thanks, of course, uh, Edward. It's uh, great to chat with you again. Well, thank you, Stefan. I've been looking forward to this. All right. Now, we have a uh, barrel full of new listeners since we last talked. We've been, you know, gaining 500 to 1,000 a day for a while. So I'm sorry for those listeners who have been around for a long time. But for the new listeners um, uh, who are being brought in by, you know, the European migrant crisis, the Donald Trump campaign, and so on, they don't know quite as much about the Federal Reserve and uh, its history and its ownership and its secret shareholding cabal and so on. So I wonder if uh, you could dip into your um, uh, anecdotes of, of um, history and uh, give us a brief introduction to the Federal Reserve and why people should care and why it matters. Yeah, those are all uh, good uh, entryways into the topic. Uh, let's start with the last one. Why does it matter? Um, who cares about the Federal Reserve, right? It uh, sounds like it's all about banking and money, monetary policy and boring things like that. Actually, when I got into the topic, I thought it might be that way, and I was very reluctant, uh, reluctant to do it. But I wanted to do something on uh, – I wanted to make a documentary on inflation. And I had some kind of a vague idea that uh, the Federal Reserve somehow was involved with it, so I thought I would check it out. Well, make a long story short, and as you very well know, Stefan – uh, what I discovered was more like a mystery story rather than a textbook uh, elocution of what I'm supposed to know about discount rates, for example. It was a, a mystery. It was la in fact, actually, it was a murder mystery. Uh, it was at that level of um, of uh, crime, you know. I, I discovered who who uh, who was uh, guilty of committing the crime, who who committed the murder, where they laid the bodies, and, and what the st cover stories were, and uh, it became intriguing. Um, and so it all started with that uh, secrecy that you mentioned a moment ago uh, that surrounded the founding of the Federal Reserve on an island, believe it or not, an island off the coast of Georgia, and it was called Jekyll Island. Well, that intrigued me, you know, and I thought, here's, here's a handle. You know, if you're taking a topic like this, you've got to have a handle to attract attention. So I thought, boy, if I'll call this the creature from Jekyll Island, and if it ever wound up in a bookstore window, and somebody was walking by and they were to see it, they think, oh, boy, this is a, a sequel to Jurassic Park or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so... <laughs> That was the kind of little trick in the title, but actually uh, the title has a great deal of uh, significance because, as I just said, the Federal Reserve was created on Jekyll Island back in 1910. But that's just the beginning of the mystery. The, uh, I'll come back to the mystery because we started off by saying, what is the Federal Reserve and why, why should people care? We should care because the Federal Reserve is a cartel. Let's use the word, the correct word. It's not a government agency like most people think, like I thought originally. It has some of the characteristics of a government agency. In other words, it has the power of law behind it because what these uh, very clever bankers did back in 1913 when it was all passed into law is they took their cartel agreement and they figuratively erased the title across the top that said cartel agreement and they wrote in very carefully Federal Reserve Act <laughs> and they took it to the idiots in Congress who thought it was somehow a measure to control the big powerful bankers. They had no idea, most of them had no idea, the congressmen and senators had no idea that this was actually written by the very banking interests that it was supposedly uh, going to control. And the fact that the legislation which was designed or offered to the American people as a way of the people through their elected representatives controlling the banking industry, which they were very suspicious about, and 
if, if they had known that that legislation to control those big bad banks was actually written by the big bad banks, why, well, of course, it wouldn't have floated. And, that and, and of the, course, it wasn't, it wasn't their first kick at the can, right? They had been struggling since the foundation of the republic to gain control of the currency oh. and to have central banking. Absolutely. They had central banking several times. And um, there's a very fascinating part of history that the, the uh, Congress and the people uh, of the country were fed up with it. They saw the devastating effect it had on the economy, and they got rid of it uh, twice before. And um, actually three times before, if you want to consider the, what was in place at the time the Constitution was originally written. We already had a central bank in place at that time. But wisely, in my view, uh, they got rid of it. And then the fourth time was the Federal Reserve System. So anyway, uh, here we have a, a cartel of uh, banks who got together and decided not to wait for legitimate legislation to be written by uh, people who wanted true reform in banking. They said to themselves, let's get in the front of this parade ourselves. We will write the legislation to control our own industry. And uh, that was the reason for the secrecy. And I don't know whether your new listeners would find this of great interest or not, but I'll just summarize by saying that it was a highly secret meeting that took place. In, uh, in my view, I don't think many wars of history were ever plotted under conditions of greater secrecy than that. I mean, they, they met together clandestinely in, uh, in New Jersey an evening uh, for a night train. They boarded on the private railroad car of Senator Nelson Aldridge, who was part of the group. They were told to arrive at the train station uh, one by one, not to come together, not to be seen together, not to talk to newspaper reporters and all that. And uh, when they got on board the train in this private railroad car, they were instructed when they addressed each other not to use their last names, to use first names only in the privacy of this car. I thought that was weird. Now, I began to question some of these stories. But then it was confirmed later by the participants themselves who wrote about it in later years. One of the fellows uh, wrote, he said, the reason we did that is because we knew that the servants on board the train uh, might talk. And if they knew who we were, and after the trip was over, they spoke to their family or friends, and the word leaked out that these particular individuals were there. Why, it could have you know, defeated the mission completely. So a lot of secrecy went on, and uh, the reason for it is quite uh, logical, quite reasonable, and that is because these bankers did not want the world to know that they were the ones that were creating the Federal Reserve Act. Well, so why is this important? Well, just think about it. What is, what is a cartel? Well, a cartel is kind of a shared monopoly, isn't it? It's a, it, it's, a, it's a monopoly over an industry, but it's shared by more than you know, one company. The competitors, it seems like, uh, or prior competitors. Certainly, that was the case in, in banking. We had some giant banking houses out there, international banking firms, Kuhn Loeb and Company, and J.P. Morgan and the Rockefeller Banking Dynasty, and they were all fighting each other, you know, trying to dominate the financial markets of the world. And there was blood all over the battlefield in London and Paris and New York. And they decided, hey, guys, we're not going to knock each other out of the ring here. Why don't we just get together and we'll put on a little gentle fight for public consumption. And they like to think that we're competing, but quietly and secretly, we will get together and form a cartel and not compete anymore. And we'll, you know, we'll fix interest rates, we'll regulate our own industry, we'll make sure that strong competitors don't come into the ring. We're in, nobody else gets in now, any, and we know big ones. So they wanted to control it. So when you think about that, here we have our monetary system. We have a situation in which the government of the United States was fooled, or purchased, if you wish to be more cynical, was purchased into transferring the right to create the nation's money to a group of private banks. And that's really what happened. The United States had the authority to issue its own currency, its own money, which is most countries do. It's considered to be one of the, the, uh, um, the definitions of sovereignty. A nation creates its own money. It operates its own military. Okay, Those two things prop up a nation. And here we have a situation in which the Congress of the United States gave away the power to create its own money to a group of private banks, a cartel of banks. And nobody, even to this day, very few people know that that's exactly what happened. 
Our money is not issued by the United States Treasury. It's issued by the Federal Reserve System. And once you understand that the Federal Reserve System is nothing more or less than a cartel of banks, this should be a pretty shocking situation. And if you wonder why, here, fast forward 100 years later, you wonder why uh, every time the banks get into trouble, uh, there's a fast session and the congressmen raise their hands and they vote this, this, and billions of dollars go where? To the banks. Why is that? Well, it's because it's designed to operate that way. They always say that they're trying to raise this money, bail out the banks to save the nation or to, um, to keep the economy from going bust. But, you know, where does the money go? Follow the money, as they say. It goes to the banks. Even the third world countries that are getting bailed out, the money, we're, we're sending money down to Mexico now or we're sending it to Argentina or we're sending it somewhere to help those poor countries. Um, it used to be... We'd say to help them fight communism. Now we say to help them fight terrorism. And we're sending the money. And what, what happens to the money? Follow the money. Well, it comes back to the New York banks because these countries owe money to the banks and they haven't been able to pay their interest payments. And so Congress votes the money. And, and <laughs> interesting the way that works because the Federal Reserve actually creates the money. Congress says, yes, go ahead. And then the Federal Reserve creates the money and then gives it to the Congress. And then the Congress sends it to the third world country. And the third world country writes the check and pays the banks for the interest payment that they're behind on. And it comes back to the banks. So once you understand that the whole system is rigged to do exactly that, to legally plunder the American people and transfer money through the banking, I mean, through the government and into the banking system and prop them up so they can do whatever they want to, then and you finally begin to understand what in the heck is really going on in the world today. So that's why it matters is because the American people and to a large extent people all around the world now are being legally plundered by this system. It struck me when you were talking about murder. Uh, that's a great introduction. And it struck me that um, when you murder a man, you've committed a terrible crime, but at least your victim's troubles are over. When you murder money, your victim's troubles are just beginning and will continue to escalate. And there's an old saying from Adam Smith that people of a particular segment of the economy, manufacturers or whatever, they almost never get together without the result being some collusion against the interests of the general public. And I think we can see that here. And um, in, in the free market, it's tough to keep a cartel going because, you know, you get a bunch of oil companies who say, oh, I'm going to raise the price of oil. But the first person to break ranks, the first company to break ranks, scoops up half the marketplace and makes a killing. So without the guy, people have always been trying to, to form cartels, but because the economic, ins they're unenforceable because they're not legal contracts. And so the first company to break ranks cleans up and that's why they always dissolve. But when cartels, and I'm thinking of like East India Company mercantilism throughout the empire as well, when cartels can gain the power of the state, then they can uh, finally achieve this nirvana for them and hell for the public of being able to set rates and set prices and set um, advantages with no one being really able to, to break ranks and that combination of the desire for cartel or rent seeking or unjust profits plus the power of the state I think is one of the, um, uh, one of the great mysteries that once we begin to penetrate into the Federal Reserve we can see and it's not a problem of the free market, it's a problem of, of state power and the granting of monopoly. Exactly, Stefan, and I'm so glad you're, you're uh, preaching that uh, sermon because the world definitely needs to hear it. Uh, that's the myth of monopoly capitalism. It's, it's a, cap a true capitalist system if it's defined in terms of a free market, not in terms of monopoly capitalism. And they're, you get into all these definitions, but the classic, uh, classic definition of capitalism, uh, monopolies really cannot, as you just said, they cannot last very long. And not only do the uh, members of the cartel uh, break rank, but there's always some uh, new kid in the block coming along. And he's got a, a better way. And all of a sudden, here comes a company c completely out of the woodwork. And within a few years, they're a serious competitor. Well, the old timers don't like that either. So uh, that's why in every case I have observed, every case you see a, a monopoly or a cartel in existence, it has always sought the support of government to make it legal and to become the enforcement arm of the cartel. Quite right. One of the founding arguments of the um, revolutionaries uh, in the late 18th century in America was taxation without representation. And I've always been struck by the idea that one of the great problems, of course, of central banking is it substitutes debt for taxation. In other words, it, it provides politicians the ability to give free money to people because the debt is down the road. They can provide benefits without directly raising taxes. 
And uh, this creates huge distortions in the political system. Because if the government says, hey, here's a thousand dollars, and then they have to tax you fifteen hundred dollars to give you the thousand dollars, people go, hey, wait, that's not really a very good deal now, is it? But if they can borrow the thousand dollars, what they're providing is taxation without representation to the next generation. And I think that's done a huge amount to corrupt politics in America. Absolutely. And uh, when I think of that phrase, taxation without representation, it triggers a lot of things in my mind. And we, today we have kind of the opposite, don't we? We have representation without taxation, <laughs> which is <Right>. worse. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's another thing that comes to mind with that phrase is that even taxation without representation wouldn't be so bad if the concept of the proper function of the state were clearly defined so that the state's uh, legitimate purpose um, was just merely to defend the lives, liberty, and property of its citizens. Uh, but where we get into trouble is w where we have this uh, democratic winner-take-all mentality. The idea that if we can just uh, somehow muster 51% uh, of the vote, that means the winner can do whatever the winner wants to do. And it's just too bad you happen to be in that 49% sucker because now we're gotcha you know and it's this mentality that has gripped the world and um, and it's in that uh, kind of a framework that we worry about representation if we knew that the whole function of the state was simply to defend us and not to be aggressive in any way and not to become the great leader the great organizer the great distributor uh, and educator and all of those things well then you know representation doesn't become very important because the the state is not going to harm you very much anyway problem is of course that those systems never last unless there's a watchdog group of some kind the guardians you know somebody somebody in society has got to take on uh, the responsibility of making sure that such a system not only is created but that it is maintained and that is another issue but still it's possible and it's encouraging to me to know that we do have answers we don't have to give up our hands in despair there are answers out there uh, the state limiting superheroes seem to be in relatively short supply throughout history but of course we all do <laughs> our part to see what we can get now <clears throat> of course I don't think it's an accident that after the creation of the Federal Reserve uh, just a couple of years later or at least after the plotting to the creation of the Federal Reserve we get the income tax and I wonder if you could help people understand because the income tax is it's like gravity like I mean if you've just been born after I guess 1913 or whatever I guess most of us have but um, it's just like well of course there's income tax but the fact is that still for the majority of the American political history there, there was no such thing and uh, of course it was a temporary measure and there's nothing more permanent than a temporary uh, government. Tempor government temporary government programs are like like temporary tattoos that get carved into your bone marrow or something but um, what is the relationship between central banking and uh, the, the, the income tax? Well, uh, I'd rather talk about the, the nature of the income tax and then we can see uh, the comparison and the relationship. The income tax is not what it appears to be. Let's start with that. Well, what does that mean? Well, it appears to be a means of providing revenue to operate the government. But it's not that. And we know it's not that because the, uh, the people that created it told us so. I've forgotten the fellow's name right now. I have it in my book. You might remember it. But he was the head of one of the branches of the Federal Reserve System. And um, it was um, after World War II. And he had written a scholarly article in a banking journal uh, advocating um, automatic or mandatory uh, withholding of income tax from people's paychecks. And this was a new idea at that time, and he's the fellow that uh, advanced the, the idea and the concept. And he explained that, now, he said, this is not, as we all know, that um, uh, the purpose of the income tax is not to raise revenue. And, of course, my eyes were re popping out of my head. Oh, of course, I knew that, but here's a guy saying so who actually is at the head of the, of the parade. And he said, it's obviously not that, because, he said, now with with modern banking structures, and he was referring to the Federal Reserve System, he said, now we have the ability to create all the money we need. We don't have to tax anybody. We just create it. So he said, this is wonderful. It's a wonderful invention, and it's the way it's going to be in the future. So we don't really need taxes, everybody, for revenue. But we do need taxes, he said, for redistribution of wealth and to engineer society. And he didn't say it in these words, but he, it was clear he was implying we need taxes to um, 
have exemption so we can reward our friends and punish our enemies to restructure society. And there you have it. That's the only reason we have an income tax. And um, just imagine how little control uh, the ruling parties would have if there were no income tax because everybody complies uh, with the rules that come out of Washington because of the, of the flow of tax money and the flow of tax exemptions. That is the mechanism. Those are the levers that they, one of the most powerful levers they have over, over us and people buckle under it. They would probably fight uh, to the death if that kind of control were uh, being enforced by bayonets and bullets. But the fact that it's being enforced by economic measures and the flow of money and credits and taxes, it's, it's subtle. You don't know who the enemy is and people just buckle under. Yeah, and the idea that... Um we could have a political system where people argue ideas rather than the bribocracy that seems to be going on at the moment. Um, it would be tough, I think, without the sort of government monopoly control uh, or the granting of the government monopoly of control to the Federal Reserve and the capacity to create money and the lack of competition. You can't sort of go and start transacting things in Bitcoin because the government really doesn't really like that too, too much. The idea that we, we'd have a, a political discussion based upon ideas rather than I wish a political favor for my friends and I wish political punishment for my enemies. I mean, it seems almost a utopian dream at this point. Yeah, it is. It is a utopian dream for the collectivists. And um, that's why we have it. That's why the, uh, the number of, of uh, rules and regulations and administrative decisions on the income tax are so voluminous. When you think about it, why do we have how many books or how many thousands of pages of rules and regulations to administer the income tax? Thousands upon thousands. Nobody's ever read them. Nobody understands them. It's, it, you have a, a building full of accountants and lawyers and they don't understand it either. Why do we have that? It's because every one of those pages, every one of those paragraphs, every one of those sentences are in there as a loophole for a friend of the ruling class or a loophole to punish an enemy of the ruling class. It's all about inequality. It's all about power. Well, and of course, it's all about giving the IRS the capacity to shred people's lives pretty much at will because there's nobody who could possibly claim to be in perfect compliance with an ever-shifting kaleidoscope of contradictory laws. Hey, absolutely. <laughs> Not only the uh, IRS, but all the other laws thrown into that. Yes, we're all guilty, absolutely guilty of some heinous crime. Right. Now, the relationship between the control of currency and the, it seems to me, quite necessary resulting control of interest rates is something that a lot of people have trouble with. And, of course, people see interest rates. We all make decisions based on interest rates uh, every day. But the degree of government control over interest rates and the fact that it seems to be pretty necessary uh, once you get uh, fiat currency, control of the interest rates seems pretty necessary. I wonder if you could help people understand those kind of dominoes. Uh, yes, I, I have trouble myself, even though I understand the mechanism. Sometimes I wonder at the mentality that is being applied to, to the mechanism because it doesn't seem to make sense. But usually if you dig deep enough, you find out that it's serving the bank's uh, interest in some way. Uh, first of all, the interest rates really are determined by the Fed, not by the government. Uh, but still, the Fed is very sensitive to the government's needs because, let's face it, that is a partnership we're dealing with here. The um, the uh, political scientists and the monetary scientists, uh, they work together. And there's kind of a, a revolving door in many cases. Sometimes they're on one side and sometimes they're on the other. But we do, <coughs> we do have these two um, uh, interests that must be served. The banks have to, have to serve their interests. And, of course, they can't ignore the, completely the political needs of the uh, support they get from Congress. So the interest rates, as I see it at least, uh, Stefan, is, is primarily a, um, a means of, of um, helping the government float its debt. I mean, let's face it now, the, the federal government lives entirely on debt. And um, it used to be, when I first became aware of this, that uh, most of the debt the bonds and the treasury notes and so forth were being snapped up by, willingly snapped up by individuals, by corporations, institutions, other governments, other central banks even, because they figured that it was a good investment, that the uh, Uncle Sam was going to uh, strangle the citizens of America to death if necessary to pay back those interest rates, and they knew that was a good bet. And uh, But then of late, um, and let me go back, 
when I first became aware of this, I think that the amount of debt that the government was issuing um, was picked up by the Federal Reserve only to the extent of about 7%. It was amazing. I thought it was more than that, but it was only about 7 Today, it's more like 98 90, almost 100%. Nobody wants to buy government, U.S. government debt anymore because they know it's on that slippery slope down to oblivion. Right, because and they can count. <laughs> they can count. I mean, when, when your <laughs> debt is big, way bigger than your entire GDP and half of your GDP <laughs> is transfer payments to people dependent on the state and the military, welfare, warfare, industrial complex, it's not that hard to figure out that it can <laughs> never be repaid. It can never be repaid, exactly. And so, yeah, the word is out. And so what's happening now is that the Federal Reserve is picking up uh, all of the debt, which means that the, um, the money supply is expanding much more rapidly than it ever did before. Previously, when the government expanded the debt, the money supply didn't expand that much because it was being picked up by people that had money already in their savings accounts. So they were taking existing money and giving it to the government for the debt. Now that doesn't happen. Newly created money is what's being used to give to the government to buy the debt. And so that means that inflation is incredibly uh, out of control. And as you've said, it'll never be repaid. There's no possible way for it. So, but the point is that I'm gradually leading up to is I think that the reason for interest rates traditionally has always been to uh, make it easy for the government to um, to push its bonds and, and notes onto the public, onto buyers. That's all. Simple as that. And, uh, and to keep that uh, money supply relatively under control so they could boast and say, well, we only have a 3% interest, I mean, inflation rate or something like that. And when now that's no longer possible. And uh, the fact that uh, the money supply is expanding so rapidly, and yet our inflation rate is not keeping pace, is, uh, is a great mystery to many people. To me, it's, it's not so much of a mystery. Uh, I think that there are two elements involved. First of all, the inflation rate, the official numbers that are being uh, told, are not true. The true inflation rate... Uh, this is Washington calling here to give me the latest figures. <laughs> That's right. It's the red phone. Do you need to answer it and change into your cape? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I should have unplugged. No, that's fine. That's fine. That. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think the numbers that are coming out of Washington are uh, totally fictitious. But that's only a small part of the deception. The, the real thing is what they like to call the euro dollars. The world still, still is functioning on Federal Reserve notes. Most countries have well, many countries, I should say, have currencies that are much more uh, worthless even than the Federal Reserve notes. And in a country like Zimbabwe, for example, um, it's impossible to engage in any um, reasonable economic transaction in Zimbabwean dollars. It's just impossible. So if you want to buy a house or operate a business or buy a car or anything, you have to use Federal Reserve notes, American dollars. And this is true all around the world. So no matter how many of these phony uh, monopoly paper dollars that are being created by the Federal Reserve, it seems like the world has an insatiable appetite for them because they need it to run their own currencies. But that game, too, is coming to an end, and I'm sure everybody can see that, um, Stefan. As you said, people can count, and um, all you have to do is just look at the charts and just look at that, that hockey stick, that vertical climb on the number of dollars that are being pushing uh, being pushed into the world economy and you can see that this is absolutely unsustainable so where it's going of course uh, uh, we know in general uh, where it's going but we don't know specifically and we don't know certainly don't know the timing in general it's going um, belly up the dollar is going to be rejected totally by the world as a reserve currency it's coming when it'll hit I don't know but you know I'm a pretty old guy and I'm pretty sure it's going to be in my lifetime. So uh, that's, that's optimistic. <laughs> yeah. we'll, do, we'll do some uh, we'll do some cardio before the end, just to make sure we can we can see the fulfillment of these youthful uh, anticipations. And it's funny because people interest rates is one of these things that because it's controlled by government, um, again, people just don't really care that much about it. But interest rates, of course, are fantastic signals for entrepreneurs, right? Because when people are saving a lot of money. 
then um, that means that they're deferring their, their spending, right? They save a bunch of money, you know, I'm saving up to buy a house. So your money's not in circulation, sitting in the bank or whatever, or under your mattress. You can go buy a house. And of course, when people uh, are saving a lot of money, it means there's lots of money available to lend. And that means that the price of money, which is what interest is, will go down because you have an excess supply. So when, when, the, um, when the interest rates go down, that's a signal to entrepreneurs, of course, that there's spending that's being deferred. So now's the time, you know, <laughs> borrow the money, upgrade your plant because, you know, build a bunch of houses because people are really getting ready. They're, they're like the, the bow pulling, it, doing, it's going to go off. And, and, and of course now, uh, and then of course, when people start spending a lot of money, then there's less money available to lend. So interest rates go up, which slows down capital investment and so on. All of these incredibly fine-tuned signals have just, I mean, people have just taken hammers to this sort of Swarovski crystal of, of uh, indicators that the free market provides for free. You know, I mean, the interest rates is one of these, like prices, one of these great pieces of information provided to entrepreneurs at no cost to themselves. You have to buy something to know how much it's, it's right. worth. And the degree of economic misallocation, which is, you know, a pretty banal term for people may end up starving, you know, but the degree of economic misallocation by governments taking over currency first and then smashing the, the long-term and short-term signals for entrepreneurs um, uh, through the manipulation of interest rates. Again, it's, it's hard, you know, I've been an entrepreneur, I guess, I'm, I'm 20 years or more now, and it's really hard to, for, for most people to understand how difficult it is to be an entrepreneur when you literally have no idea what's going on, you know, six to two, I mean, in, a, in an age of regime uncertainty, which was hitherto largely unknown in sort of the post-industrial West, but um, I think it's kind of like a banana state republic uh, uh, randomness these days. Well, everything you say is right on target in my view, uh, Stefan. Yeah, the, uh, the malfunctioning of the free market, uh, malfunctioning is a benign term too, isn't it? I mean, free market is dead, let's face it. it it's like saying there's a malfunctioning in my life support system. Uh, uh, my, my phone won't boot up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, nothing is working the way it should. And we've, we've evolved uh, into a, uh, a system in which um, excellence is not determined by uh, production or even honesty. It, does not, uh, it is not determined, um, success is not determined by the ability to serve uh, society, to provide more goods and services uh, at a lower price. It's determined by one thing only, and that's your political influence. The degree to which you can go to a legislative assembly and influence the uh, legislators to pass laws that favor you and your, uh, your enterprise and um, give you an advantage over your competitors. And the price for that, of course, is passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices for the goods and services and a lot less choice. So there you have it. That's the world that we live in. And I see all these poor souls out there in the streets demonstrating against capitalism. You know, we want more government controls because look at what these big bad capitalist banks have done. And they don't realize that they're just calling for more of the same uh, drug that's uh, killing the system. And they don't realize that we haven't had true capitalism here for uh, over 50 years, you know. Sad. Yeah, I mean, certainly since uh, what Nixon took the U.S. off the last remnants of the gold standard in 71, because it was really tough to have a welfare state and run the war in Vietnam at the same time and bribe all the countries around the world to do whatever you wanted in the sort of economic dollar imperialism that's characterized the post-Second World, post World War U.S. foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been a long time. And it's really tragic, and but it's kind of inevitable because, you know, as, as a lot of libertarian thinkers have pointed out, once you gave government control over education, um, then it really was just a matter of time until everybody viewed the government as their savior and the free market as their potential enemy because once you educate children outside of the free market, the free market is no longer something that can be consistently advocated within that paradigm. And I think this is another reason why, you know, I was in government schools for over a decade and um, I never learned anything about this. I mean, I don't know if the teachers don't know or it's just, it's not productive for them to communicate it uh, or I don't know, maybe their parents are bankers of the kids and they're <laughs> gonna get upset. I mean, but I think that level of propaganda, uh, both focusing on the inconsequential and avoiding communicating the consequential, uh, it seems almost an, a natural result of this kind of takeover. 
Yeah, I think there is a both. Uh, there's both a natural and an unnatural element there. I think there is a, a natural uh, tendency that the further away you get away, uh, the further you get away from basic principles, uh, the the less stress there is on your uh, ability to survive, the less you lose, I mean, the more you lose your ability to survive. Um, and so that's a natural thing. We see that happening in the decay of civilizations over and over again. They struggle, they grow, they prosper, and then the generations pass and the kids come along and they don't know what it was like. And first thing you know, they slump, they slump back down into decay and some more aggressive power comes along and wipes them out and they've got another cycle. And that, but that, enough that, about Europe. <laughs> yeah, enough about Europe. Yeah, that'll never happen to us, will it? Uh, and but uh, and then that's the natural cycle. But now we have this unnatural cycle where people are actually engineering this because they see that the process of what we would call decay is actually a process of great um, uh, benefit to them, the ruling class. They like they would like to see the old system, our what we call the old capitalist system, the free enterprise system. They would like to see that decay because that'll throw us back as it is now doing to a, a sort of a feudalist system in which we have the clearly recognized ruling class and everybody else is uh, supposed to be happy to serve that class. That's where we're headed if we're not there already. Oh, <clears throat> all right, yes, there's, <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll, I'll keep it brief because, I mean, you're the, <laughs> the expert here. But uh, I'm going to get your thoughts on this argument that um, th th there's the old perspective that says, you know, there's really only two rules that you need in society. Number one, don't initiate force against people, don't initiate violence against people. Number two, keep your word, you know, if you write it down, and keep your contracts and all that. Now, that's not a lot. I know that like, four guys and a dog can get that system up and running for the most part. And the spontaneous self-organization of the free market is antithetical to this sort of pyramid control structure that a lot of the sociopathic sadistic control freaks in the planet want to have a whip to rule over people. And the free market is their natural enemy because this, the free market and its spontaneous self-organization removes the need for the bureaucratic control class because it just things work on their own uh, and nobody's in control of it. And the fact that nobody's in control of it is exactly why it works, going back to the Mises argument about uh, price and calculation and socialism. And so if you have a system where it's like, okay, don't initiate force and keep your word. Okay, that, 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 those are two commandments. It's, you know, we've even gone down uh, from, from uh, Moses. And, and if you have spontaneous self-organization within society, then you don't need all of this overhead of the bureaucratic class. But they've kind of adapted to the existing system. I can't imagine that your average, I don't know, guy who's in the bureaucratic system in the Department of Education is going to have a huge amount to offer a lean and mean private corporation. So their entire economic success at the moment and what they've adapted to is focused on continuing and expanding this command and control system because the spontaneous self-organization leaves them like uh, redundant. I mean, there's no, there's no point really having them. They'd have to adapt and I don't really think that they want to. <laughs> <laughs> no, they don't want to. And, uh, you know, I put myself occasionally, I put myself in the mental position of these people. And I think, what would it be like, what would have happened, what could have happened to me in my development that might have changed my direction? And it's not hard to imagine. You know, it's the old carrot and the stick. You know, uh, as a kid, you're coming up and you say, well, you, you look around and say, who is succeeding? That, I want to be like that person. Who is driving around in the big cars? Who's got the big house, you know? Who's the, who the person that's on stage? Who's the person that people look up to and admire? And so forth. I want to be like that person. So we have role models. And if we pick the wrong role model, if we don't understand the things that you've been talking about, Stephen, I can see how a lot of young people would be uh, sort of attracted to go into that avenue. So it reminds me of that cartoon, a little... The kid is talking to his dad. Dad's reading the newspaper, and the kid is sort of standing next to the chair. And the dad says, oh, so you've decided to go into, um, uh, I says, you've decided to go into organized crime. Hmm. And then he says, is it public or private sector? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, just for the younger listeners uh, who don't know, a, a newspaper is, uh, it's an iPad made out of wood. Uh, just, just for people who don't know. Um, now, let's, let's um, talk about... I mean, we, we touched on inflation, but I, I sort of wanted to, to circle back on it because to me, inflation is, is one of the big, really in-your-face problems that comes out of this mercantilist fiat currency system. 
Because a lot of, like when I think about, I, I call it those a supercharged stock market, which is all this money crashing around like a tsunami in a fish tank trying to find the next five minutes worth of profit. And that's because there are way, there's way too much money in the stock market. Most people don't want to be in the stock market. They recognize that you really should know what you're doing. But you have to go into the stock market because the government's inflationary policies are eating away at your money. It's like there's a smoking, burning smell coming from under your mattress, and that's your dollar bills self-combusting into nothingness. And so people end up charging into the stock market just to try and avoid the effects of inflation. And people don't remember um, what it was like, neither do I, <laughs> but people don't remember what it was like when not only did your money have stable value when it was gold-backed, um, and you could, uh, you know, $1,000 now would be would be able to buy exactly the same amount in 10 years, give or take, right? And your money might even increase in value, you know, throw it into a savings account and the bank just lends it out to people doing pretty safe stuff. You get a couple of points out of that. And the degree to which economic activity is distorted by people trying to escape the sort of brain dead zombie cash eating inflationary policies, I think is kind of hard for people to understand. I mean, in a sense, the housing crash, not only driven by excess money, but also people are like, well, I've got to buy something that increases in value because if I just keep my money, it's going to decrease in value. And how much economic activity is being driven by people attempting to escape the predation of inflation, I think is hard to overestimate. It is. It's impossible uh, to come up with a number, in my mind at least. And everything you say, uh, Stefan, is right, spits bad as far as I'm concerned. And it, it points to me one of the uh, frightening and significant shifts in how people relate to money that's going on right before our very eyes. And I think you mentioned at the beginning of the program, or someone did recently, that uh, we're going into this cashless society. And why is that? And, you know, and, and what is this difference between bailout and bail-in? And you come to the realization that there's no place to put money anymore to save money. Uh, unless you're going to go to the traditional definition of money, money meaning merely a medium of exchange, and that could include gold or silver, a medium of exchange. If that's your, if you include that, well, then you could still have a place, one place left to put money that will not be uh, deteriorating in its purchasing power. And it will last, as long as the pirates uh, allow you to have it. You know, They will probably say, hey, we can't allow this last escape door. We're going to brick up this door, and they'll pass all kinds of draconian laws. As they know, you're, you're being unpatriotic. You, we need oh, you mean like they, they grab your gold and, you're stealing from the bankers. Okay, oh, well, you're, well, st you're stealing from the people, or, or yeah. you're creating economic havoc. You're the yeah. one that's responsible for all of this because you see your whole and you're taking money out of circulation and, and so forth. They'll have some very good uh, stories to tell about why you're the, the culprit rather than the victim. But anyway, aside from that, people have, they can't put their money anyplace that's secure anymore. Uh, now that the bail out or the, the bail in process is, is being definitely uh, prepared for us, we know that. Um, we know that probably the next uh, round of bank failures, even in the United States, is quite likely are going to be a bail-in, which means that the banks will simply confiscate a substantial portion of the deposits that everybody has in the banks. Well, once this word gets out, people will want to take their money out of the banks. Well, that, uh, that's a stupid thing to do, isn't it? Why, why, why don't you just want to leave it in the bank so they can steal it from you? Uh, so they want to make that impossible. That's what's really behind this cashless society. They do not want you to be able to take it out of the banks. So you have to be exposed to this, um, uh, this legalized plunder. It's as simple as that. People who think this, sorry to interrupt, but for people who think this is outlandish, I mean, this is not prediction, this is history. Not only has it happened many times in history where people have been limited in what they can take out of the bank, it happened recently in Greece. Uh, in Malta, uh, didn't they take uh, a certain percentage of people's savings just right out of their uh, currency uh, in the bank? I mean, this is not outlandish. This has already been happening in recent memory, particularly in Europe. Absolutely. In Cyprus, I guess it was up to 50% of, uh, of the deposits of many depositors. So it, it's a serious situation, and you can be sure the people in Cyprus are not interested in keeping their money in the banks. And uh, that's one of the problems they've had there ever since that. So when we hear the, um, these meetings, like the, the, uh, the recent uh, meeting of the, uh, the 20 largest uh, countries, they, had a big conference on economic policy. And everybody knew about the, the fact that they gathered together, but nobody reported on what they decided. 
<laughs> well, well, that's complicated <laughs> for a lot of reporters. You know, yeah, it's not a sex tape, so it's very <laughs> difficult for them to delve yeah. into the math. <laughs> and what they decided is that they're going to they've they've approved of the bail-in process. They said this works, this is fine, this is the model for the future, and they they approved of the cashless uh, society. For, those two have to go together. So it's already uh, you know it's in the works, and all you have to do is just open your eyes and see what's coming. So what do you do about it? Well, you have to get off the track. If you see the train coming down the track and you stand there looking at it and saying, gee, I wonder what I'm supposed to do, it's, uh, well, I hate to be cruel about it, but maybe, uh, maybe that's the process of natural selection, uh, eliminating the human population of its idiots, you know? There is an old saying about um, the Jews in Germany in the 1930s that the pessimistic Jews ended up relatively safe in America, but the optimistic Jews ended up in the concentration camps. And so, there, you know, I, I think optimism and pessimism are largely ad hominems or praiseworthy things to just, I think we just have to be realistic. And uh, the best predictor of future behavior uh, in individuals and in governments is relevant past behavior. And when governments run out of money, uh, they don't sit there and say, well, you know, got to tell you, boys, it was a fun ride. Man, we had these people fooled. And I uh, guess we got to fess up now that it's all been a kind of uh, own your unborn children, sell them off to Chinese banks, just con game. Ah, uh, you know, the gig is up. I guess, uh, hey, anybody hiring? You know, I mean, they're not going to do that. They're going to do everything that they can to keep and escalate their control over you and your finances. Because, you know, I've made this argument many times. You're not, you're not a citizen. You're, you're tax livestock. I mean, all you are is an asset. You're, you're an entry in a ledger. And uh, they no more care about taking away your freedoms and your money than a farmer cares about taking milk or meat from a cow. You are just a utility to them. Uh, they are not... They don't view you as, as sovereign consciousness and people with a soul or, or people with uh, um, uh, a real human identity. I mean, you're just uh, livestock. And uh, the, the, for, the, for the cows to say, what, that guy? The farmer? Yeah, he gives us, uh, you know, health care. You know, he, he gives us food. I mean, he loves us. It's like, nope, he just does that so he can get the milk and meat from you. Yeah, and he's interested in your optimum production only. Right. And, he, and he, he's also very careful about building those fences so you can't get out. Well, that's a great analogy, uh, uh, Stefan. I've always admired your ability to, to uh, condense it down to something that people can understand. A little shocking the first time you hear it, but then you have to start shaking your head and say, yep, he's got it right. That's the way it is. And so, it's funny to see how even the sorry to interrupt, but it's funny to see how in the sort of current presidential elections, um, it used to be that just people that like Ron Paul, you know, would talk about the Fed and would talk about uh, ending the IRS or ending income tax, and and of course he was considered to be like the crazy uncle you occasionally bring down from the attic for the entertainment of the children. But it seems that the work that you've been doing for 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 many decades is starting to hit mainstream American political discussions. Not on the left, of course. We scarcely want to imagine that because you can't take away the cheddar they use to buy votes. But on the right, at least, it does seem like Ted Cruz is talking about uh, eliminating the, um, the IRS and uh, people talking about, you know, the kind of um, uh, flat taxes or, or tax gradients you can fill out on the back of a um, uh, a postcard, which is, I don't know, Instagram with trees. I'd have to translate everything to the younger <laughs> audience. But um, uh, do, do you think that this is going to continue to be part of the American political discourse? Well, uh, yes, I do. I think it's uh, uh, your um, uh, discussion of the right. It, it's something that stuck with me a little bit. It didn't fit right. Uh, I don't really see that the the rhetoric that comes out of the candidates for office, uh, of people who are in, the, let's say, the Republican camp, they like to um, present themselves as being opposites of the left. But, you know, uh, when you really uh, peel off that uh, Republican name or the, get under those words like conservative and liberal and look underneath those those uh, monikers, you find that there's very little difference, really, in the political philosophy of all of the candidates out there. It's very, it's very discouraging, but uh, the word is, we have to be realistic, remember, not pessimistic or optimistic, but realistic, and um, so if we are realistic, we have to be very skeptical about 
the speeches that we hear from the candidates on either side of the political spectrum. Because in my view, I, I see the left and the right as pretty much just opposite wings on the same ugly bird. And the bird is called collectivism. And, uh, and all, all of the major candidates for uh, either political party are in total agreement in the underlying philosophy of collectivism. And until we recognize that, uh, I don't think we can make an intelligent choice because we don't have one to make. There, we have no candidates, really, that represent a constructive opposite to collectivism. So our goal, I think, is not to worry so much about who you're going to vote for because you, you're not going to win um, by, by voting for a candidate that has been pre-selected by people who do not have your best interest in mind. You know, it's like a, like a rigged uh, football game, uh, where both teams are owned by the same uh, owner, and uh, he doesn't care which one wins. Uh, he's going to come out like gangbusters no matter what. But anyway, um, so anyway, that's my little my little rant about the, the political arena today. And uh, and until the time comes that we have uh, convinced a large number of people out there that there is that there is something called collectivism. We have to put those words back into the vocabulary. Collectivism versus individualism. And once we get enough people recognizing that collectivism is our enemy, and it's not communism, it's not fascism, it's not Republicans or Democrats or, or left or right, it's collectivism. And only then do I think we have a chance to really start rebuilding the system and restoring all of the things that we are, are lamenting that we have lost. It starts with it starts in the hearts and in the minds of the American people, and that's our job. And if you could give, I think, for a lot of the audience, uh, particularly the younger set, um, for them, the word collectivism probably refers to a hoarding disorder. I'm, I'm, I'm too, I collect too many things. Can you give people the, the ABCs of, of what it is that you mean by collectivism as, as the foundation of that which needs to be fought? Well, uh, first of all, uh, yes, I'd love to do that. It's one of my favorite topics, and I know it is yours, too. Um, but it's hard to condense down, but I suppose I have identified uh, nine different uh, significant traits, uh, principles, that are totally opposite to each other. Uh, on the one side, the collectivists believe one thing, and on the other side, individuals believe the opposite. And I've identified over the years nine different uh, categories that this is true. And we don't have time to go into all of them, but I would think perhaps the most fundamental and most descriptive of them is the question of which is more important in society, the individual or the group. And that's really the heart of the issue. Collectivists believe that the group is more important than the individual and that the individual must be sacrificed if necessary for the greater good of the greater number. Now, that's what I was taught in school. And I, I thought at the time, it was a great, grand idea, after all. Isn't that the basis of democracy, you know? The greater good of the greater number, 51% wins everything and, and so forth. But and then in later years I began to question, and finally it dawned on me, uh, Stefan, that this is complete baloney. First of all, there is no such thing as a group. You cannot see a group. You cannot touch a group. You can see individuals, lots of them. We call that a group. And we can touch individuals, and if we touch a lot of them, you say I've touched the group. But it's like the word forest. There is no such thing as forest. There are only trees. They're the only things that are real. And the, the word forest is, an, is a word to describe an abstraction that's held in the mind. It's a mathematical concept. It's not real. It's intellectual. And so when we say that something that is only an abstraction is not real, has more rights, or is supreme to something that is real, we've made a huge intellectual mistake because we've set in motion a, a, a condition in which individuals can, individuals can step forward and say, I represent the group. <laughs> I am the leader of the group. And our party or our little uh, oligarchy represent the group, you know, like the Communist Party or something like that. And therefore, we speak for the group, and what we say is for the group's best interest. And this is the foundation of all of the collectivist uh, mal malarkey out there, that, the, you know, the group must survive and the individual must support the group. Okay, there's the starting point. Um, it, you know, take the idea of, a lynch mob, for example. Now, there is a perfect example of democracy. There's really only one dissenting vote. <laughs> 
And, it, and he's running pretty fast. <laughs> and he's running like hell. But, you know, if you really believe that majority should rule, and that's the end of the discussion, uh, you have to be pretty much in favor of lynch mobs. Um, but naturally, once you go there, you start, wait a minute, what about the individual? Doesn't the individual have any rights? And, of course, now we're into a serious discussion that leads only to one place, which is that the individual is the element that is the foundation of society. And the greater good for the greater number is actually achieved by defending the individual against the passion and greed of the group. That's the foundation of every free society. And so there's a good start, all right. There are many more issues like that. But once a person gets past those labels and peels the labels off and starts looking at the element of the, of the ideology itself, I have run into very few people, even dyed-in-the-wool leftists, that don't come out the other side saying, yeah, I guess I'm an individualist all this time and I didn't even know it. Yeah, And I, I would just add people. one more thing, no, if ahead, I may. Ahead. If I may just add, we have a, a lot of material on this on our website. You mentioned it earlier. Anybody that wants to explore this, and I hope that's many, please come to freedomforceinternational.org, and you're going to find a lot of information on this topic there. All right. Well, listen, I, I'm, maybe we can do another show about the nine principles because I, I like you, think that collectivism, uh, you know, when I was younger, I read Atlas Shrugged and at the time it seemed like science fiction and then it seemed like current events and now it seems like archaeology. It's so <laughs> past where it should have been. But uh, thanks so much for your time. It's always uh, a, a, a great pleasure to chat. I wanted to remind people, realityzone.com and uh, as he mentioned, freedom forceinternational.org. Again, the links will be below. Go and peruse this stuff. It's really, really great stuff. And it gives you clarity within your own mind, but I think most importantly as well, it gives you the ammunition and the sort of um, uh, synthesized arguments that you can easily bring to provoke thought in others. Because, you know, a goal as thinkers is not to tell other people what to think, but using the old Socratic question method, provoke thought. Uh, because we don't want any more conformity in the world. There's no such thing as conformity to the truth. There is only such thing as conformity to fear. And uh, when we pursue the truth, we can only do that by enabling people to think clearly for themselves. And there's lots of material uh, on your websites to to help with that. So I strongly urge people to go and, and check it out. Oh, it's always a, a great pleasure. And I'm sure we'll talk again soon. And uh, have yourself a wonderful week. Thank you, Stefan. And same to you. I'm looking forward to the next time. Take care.